the CIO's role in delivering exponential value to the business. And I have the good, good fortune to be joined by four eminent minds who can share their knowledge on this very topic. And I'm gonna see the question, delivering exponential value to the business, two questions. What constitutes value, especially when you've got multiple stakeholders in the business and value can be subjective? How do you get consensus consensus on that? And then what represents exponential value, taking that value even further? And then the second part of that question is, how do you deliver value? So the emphasis is, it's not just, it's how do you get that in the hands of people? So I'm going to start, Chris, with you, because I've interviewed all these people beforehand. And Chris said to me, value is driven by the environment in which you are operating. You said to me, and Chris, you introduced to me the term of relentless incrementalism that you're doing in Charter Hall. So how are you relentlessly, incrementally delivering value? Thank you, Peter. That's not my term. I should start by saying I may have borrowed that. Um, can I take a step back for a second? I've been dancing around in the IT corporate world for 33 years, and there's a few things that have just held true for me throughout my career. And I'd start by saying value is in the eye of the beholder, is a new phrase we can coin. Um, I think what, what has never failed me is you can't if we said for a second that we're all in the room today to be subject matter experts, to be deeply curious in technology and innovation and where the world is going, let's take that as a given, we can't start to talk about value unless we deeply understand our stakeholders. And in any organisation I've worked with, that's probably been the path for value realisation above all. And that can come in the form of stakeholders within the organisation, but also naturally your customers. You know, I would meet with investors three to four times a month to get that external view on what's important to an investor investing in Charter Hall. Um, within our organisation, we have different perspectives of value. Um, in August, I was in front of our ARC, and our ARC were laser focused on security and risk. A month later, I'm in front of the board in September, and on the agenda that I'm to talk to is our AI strategy. Same subset of people, but a different lens at a different point in time. And I think when we start to realize that um, value isn't just one thing at one point in time, it can be somewhat seasonal, mm -hmm. uh, then I think we can, we can ebb and flow, if that makes sense. The term um, relentless incrementalism, um, I'll borrow from James Clear's Atomic Habits. If you haven't read the book, book it's worth a read. Um, James talks about this idea of if you can just change um, how you operate in a day by 1% improvement per day, then by the end of the year, you'll be 37 times more effective than you were at the beginning of the year. And if you pretend for a second you could actually do that, um, that's an idea that works particularly well in Charter Hall. Okay. We've got a CEO saying, do not blow up our business by wildly changing technology. You know, we are custodians of $90 billion worth of other people's money. And we take that role incredibly seriously and widespread technological change that could interrupt a return on investment or an experience for a tenant in one of our many amazing assets uh, is not my, my remit in this gig. Mm. But in past lives coming out of media, focused on building digital streaming platforms and um, upsetting, if you will, disrupting the user experience for, for digesting content, the remit was very different. Okay. So value is not one thing for everybody. Well, let me bring in David, because uh, David, when we were speaking, you were talking to me, the, the value proposition is reconciling between You've got to balance financial cost revenue benefits versus customer experience. You know, you're a CIO within uh, an airline, you know, ultimately you're in a duopoly. And so you've got to make sure that experience is good and enriched for people to keep, to keep them going. But you said you've also got to be clear on the principles. And, and you felt that the principles were the, almost the guardrails for what is the value you're pursuing. Could you outline your thinking in that area? Sure, yeah, I, and I do agree. Um, it uh, values in the by being something different to everybody, but also it's about timing, and that's why the principles are important. So, um, as you, everybody knows, we, we were in bankruptcy for a while, and we came out of bankruptcy, private equity private equity owned, so transforming in a very big hurry, and so that means lots of priorities, lots of decisions to make, and so that's where we come back to the principles, and so. Um, 
and the timing, it, it really depends on where we are in the cycle and the business about what's important and what drives value. So mm -hmm. we look at the principles for prioritizing every quarter. It's important to do that with the executive team, but also with the CEO in the room, especially our CEO. She's got, always got an opinion, so we need to make sure um, she's got her fingerprints on it. Um, but we then need to try and balance off um, I'll give you some examples. So when we came out of um, bankruptcy and the emerging back uh, with a new business model, new products, new go-to-market, initiatives that supported that and getting our products in market before the demand came back and we were at a structural disadvantage was very important. So those things were, were, were sort of biased early on. And now we're sort of with, in a sort of a, more of a subdued revenue market. We're looking at cost efficiencies, um, but then from a customer perspective, we spend a lot of time listening to our customers, what they're willing to pay for, what sort of products they want, and their pain points. And so that also drives um, value um, and we have to weigh those things off against the other, other, the other choices. Um, and as I said, those things change. We look at them every quarter to make sure we're working on the most important thing at the time. Jacob, you said to, th said to me the importance of having some sort of strategic roadmap or North Star, but more importantly, n the IT people knowing how they contrib contribute towards it. Could you elaborate a bit more on that sort of uh, perception? Look, I think there's, there's uh, seams within every organisation. And so if you can bring technology and the business together in a shared kind of plan that sort of brings together a seam, Hmm. common alignment on whatever it is, supported by things like a technology roadmap or some business strategies with metrics, then you're already going somewhere in terms of reducing any friction. If then, if you can craft it in a way that everyone in the team understands how they contribute to it, you're really going towards that exceptional value because everyone knows that if they're not working on that, then maybe it's not part of the key things we're trying to achieve. And when we spoke about exponential value, you, you sort of almost draw an analogy with the great sports team where there was a sense of trust between people working together. So I got the feeling from you exponential value is often people driven rather than uh, uh, out of the technology you're using in some ways. Yeah, I mean, we've heard today a lot of great examples of technology, but often they fail when you don't have trust, you don't have sponsorship or, you know, it's not really understood. So if you can create an environment where the technologists can like lean in and really um, influence the business and the business is listening, then, and you know, it's particularly when it's aligned on some sort of plan, I think that's, um, that's a long way towards um, how sports team work, right? Everyone can play their position. What's that? Uh, um, you skate to where the puck is going to be. Not yeah, the, um, it's escaped me, but the, the show, the guy with the moustache, you know, the, um, yeah, Merv? No. no. <laughs> Ted Lasso, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So like Ted Lasso, like, you know, season three, whatever it was, the ultimate basketball, like everyone's sort of playing a, a different position and uh, 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 covering for each other and then they started playing like that, you know. If you can create something similar um, and you can trust each other, it doesn't matter if you're in the tech side or on the business side, quite often when these teams are working closely together, you, you don't really know. And Claudia, when we spoke before, and you were talking to me about IT in many ways, leading with the areas like innovation. And you, you spoke to me about risk management and, and highlighting that for the board. That could be quite confronting for some people here to recognize that they're actually going to take the, the business on a, on a journey. But you, you were saying that integral to the IT role is being that change agent. Yeah, yeah, I think the um, the role of the CIO has really changed, uh, and it's no longer functional. And you can hear that in the, you know, in these narratives here. I, I think you the, I, the CIO as a role has become incredibly strategic. It's become much closer to the business. It has to be very customer focused. Um, and when it comes to managing risk and and change, it's often leading the way because to truly lead in tech, tech is transformative in itself. Um, it is often core business. And so you're not just transforming technology in your own teams, but often you end up transforming the business. And that's a whole different value proposition. Um, and whether the CIO should or shouldn't be leading, and that's a debate in itself, often they end up leading anyway, <laughs> because that's where the burning uh, platform started. Mm. And that's, you know, I think to truly achieve a lot of um, business objectives, you have to um, you know, transform through tech. 
And I think tech, um, particularly post-pandemic, it's not just being close to the strategy, it's being close to resilience. And I break down resilience into um, yeah, the, the ability to create um, insights, to foresight. And we, we talked a little bit about the importance of data, but also being able to, to see forward um, with that data, getting really sort of deep uh, uh, into that, um, the forecasting piece, the how do you how are you bring Gen AI so that um, you get the inside out, outside in view. Then you go from foresight to the ability to respond, and that's down to your strategy. And I think, you know, you can see the different strategies in these narr narratives here where uh, the renowned um, strategist, Michael Porter, basically said there were only three strategies. And, you know, you could combine them in various different ways, but you, you've got um, cost leadership, differentiation, and focus, and everything in between. But, um, but at the end of the day, you're going to pick one of those strategies and implement that through technology at the end of the day. Uh, and the point you said to me was it, it's having that commercial focus on, you, you can have the ideas, but you've got to look at them through a commercial lens for the organisation. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, I think... Um, it's, yeah, it's not just about the tech. I think we've been talking a lot about it being outcomes focused mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of organisations are starting to shift the way they measure success, the way they measure outcomes and it has to be commercial, it has to be more about the customer. I think a lot of people's agile transformations um, sort of aim to get there, to bring the business closer together to tech um, in a structural way and arguably you know, it's hard to transform in agile ways <laughs> in, the, in the first place. But what's hardest and what few organisations are, are managing to do is um, aligning their agile um, or, or structural transformations to the customer and to those same commercial outcomes as in tech and business. Um, and I think of, um, there's a nice example that I like. There's a, there's a bank in the UK called NatWest and they did a big agile transformation and they did it end to end and it was an impressive transformation. But they say where the rubber really hit the road was where the, the missions in each of their, um, uh, uh, their squads became all about the customer. So um, savings account wasn't about helping customers save. It was all about customer resilience. Mm -hmm. um, credit cards is, is not about credit cards. It's about um, improving the customer's credit ratings. Okay. And just... Can, can I bring Jacob in, in on this? Because Jacob was, he was also talking to me about the, the importance of taking a product focus towards that. And you thought the way of delivering value is, is looking at the systems that you deliver for customers more through a product management lens. Can you tell us a bit more about that journey the bank's been on? Because I can see that being quite a cultural transition from month annual budget cycles to more persistent funding, more dedicated teams, that sort of type of stuff. Look, yeah, so product, I don't want to talk uh, enterprise agile theory, but, you know, we're, CBA is trying to move towards enterprise agile. And we're, what's different this time, I think, versus previous times is, is probably more business-led than tech-led, so a um, little bit of line there. Um, meaning, and, and, and to my earlier point, aligned with business and tech teams together, persistently funded, um, and focused on what is most important for those particular areas. How do you pick the product areas and how do you define them is, um, is I think, one of the challenges there. So how do you create the seams and how big or small do you make them? Um, but, yeah, we, we're doing that. I mean, it's, it's helpful because then when everyone's aligned and you don't have the concept of projects, you know, these, uh, I guess you still need projects sometimes, but projects are gone in, in general. Um, then you have the love, the ownership of whatever you're building in a way that means it's going to be you know, a more strategic and longer lasting asset than, than otherwise. So, um, And there was something else you said before I thought that was worth sharing here was about the importance of IT being the catalyst for ideas, often telling the business uh, an outcome that they may not see, uh, which I can imagine is quite a provocative thing for sort of to do to say you could do that a better way. Can you give? Yeah, and you're allowed to share this yeah, example because I. Well, I've got an example which uh, you know we um, a lots changing. Obviously, you know we're 25 years or however long since there's been a, a recession. So, in one of my areas in uh, modelling and data, we do capital models. We do um, you know 
probability of default models. These are how the bank makes a lot of money, works out how much we, we, we can lend and how much capital we hold. Now, we do it really well, you can see that. Um, but as we looked at a couple of examples, it's obvious that the process, which I'll just describe really quickly, uh, model development, model validation, then model implementation and deployment, and then monitoring, those steps. Now, they're all kind of done, have been done in a particular way for those in financial service. I think it's a industry standard from what I understand. Now, they're all done manually. Now, tech's moved a long way, so um, I need to provide lineage on data and I need to be able to show that really clearly on all models. I need to do a whole lot more. Um, and as we looked at that process, we said, well, actually, that's just the SDLC process, right? But the business has been doing it for so long, really well, by the way. Uh, and so now, as we're having to redo a lot of our models, because the sort of maybe they yeah, are based on data and have to be slightly different than the last 20 odd years, we can move it a lot quicker because that whole process used to be quite manual, is just the SDLC process, you know, rather than touching it twice, we had model development versus model Im implementation. I mean, as a tech person, I was really, I guess, shocked to see that that was done so manually. And yeah. so, you know, um, really just sort of imagining, hey, this is how you could do it. They're calling it one-click deployment and the business thinks it's amazing. Now, uh, it's pretty cool, yes, but this is just SDLC. And so I think there's these pockets where we can agitate with trust and then, you know, we really be able to deploy a lot quicker, obviously, at the speed. So. But then you, you must have got, it's not broken, don't fix it. You said it's working well. It's the f source of a lot of revenue for the bank. It would strike a lot of people in this room as a, an area you'd, you'd go to with sort of, if you had a faint heart, you wouldn't go anywhere near it. So, so putting your hand up to say we can change that would be a big proposition from IT. You know, you, you use your opportunities, so I can't talk about why, but you know, there was a couple of things that okay. gave, gave you the in and you know, you go for it, right? Never so, waste a crisis. Yeah. <laughs> okay. David, you had this view also that mm -hmm. the role for IT is to be the proponent of ideas to, to the business. Um, I think the words you said to me, you've got to bring forward ideas that we can enable and support the business. There's not much you do in an airline that doesn't involve technology. That's right. You said you've got a, a CEO who leans in quite heavily to the organization. So mm -hmm. you've got her, an engagement with a, with a senior stakeholder. Mm -hmm. How do you foster that then to sort of put the suggestions and ideas to her? Well, she, um, when we were emerging out from bankruptcy, when she was sort of resetting the company, one of the things she did was she took um, the tech team out of finance and put it in the customer function. And so she sort of set the parameters for, I guess, how we go go forward and work together and the culture she was wanting. So you know, putting the, the tech and digital team with the, the product strategy, the customer strategy, the guest contact center, that was a pretty key decision early on. And that's um, that's driven us to be well integrated with the business. It sort of drives the, the culture in IT that we think and work with the business. So most of our initiatives are business-led and from a culture perspective, it's about the outcome of that initiative, whether you're in a squad or whether you're in a project. There's a business owner, but we have joint joint sponsors, so we have joint governance over it. Um, but um, that, that's the outcome we're working to, and um, and we'll we'll make probably bad technology decisions on some projects because the outcome we're getting for the whole project is better overall, and the benefit of of the outcome of the project offsets the negative sides effects of it in IT. So making better business decisions because we're working on it together. And you spoke strongly to me beforehand about how you valued the diversity of your team mm -hmm. and the different perspectives that that brought. Mm -hmm. um, diversity is one of those sort of uh, topics uh, that can get people hot and cold, I yeah. suppose, really. Why do you see diversity as a strength? Uh, well, um, I guess coming out of bankruptcy, we, we got the, the opportunity to rebuild a lot of the tech team and because we had um, went from sort of keeping the lights on to a big transformation, we had to grow a lot. And so that gave us an opportunity to bring lots of different people in. And so we really sort of focused on sort of gender diversity, background diversity, industry diversity. So we've got lots of different ideas and the experience that we can bring to the table. Um, but transforming in such a short amount of time as we have been doing, Having that diversity really helps with the thinking and overcoming problems, and so we're quite proud of that. And um, I think that's very that's helped us a lot in the engagement with the business because we've got lots of different perspectives to bring from lots of different industries. 
Now, Chris, you told me you're running a dating agency oh, please. in one of your one of your things. So you better tell the audience what is the dating agency in Charter Hall. You weren't meant to quote that out loud. Yeah, I know, but it was too good a line. I could get in a lot of trouble sorry, for saying Chris. that out loud. But we have um, we have a number of CEOs within our organisation that manage various sectors, and they can be so laser focused on building their own sector and do it with such expertise. But from time to time, organisations such as IT, which span the whole business, get to see ways in which improvements might be being built in one particular sector and opportunity exists in another. And the term I used was, at times, it's somewhat of a dating agency to bring these people together because uh, they can't necessarily see. And it's not, a, it's not a lack of willingness. It's just a proximity to what's going on in other areas of the business. Mm. IT is privileged in that regard, as is groups like finance or the people team. Uh, another thing you said also that I thought was quite in interesting was that the business cases you make, they're developed by the business, not yes. IT to the business. That's that's different from many organisations. I told. How does that work in practice? Yeah, it, was a, it was a game changer for us. So IT is organised quite differently in our business to what you might find in others. Rather than going down a traditional digital team, application support team, we've structured IT around our customers outside of the organisation. And for Charter Hall, those are tenant customers who occupy our buildings or they are investors. And then there's group technology or the core technology that would be existing in any industry vertical. And the funding mechanisms for technology are twofold. There's a what's called an IT must-do budget. Mm -hmm. I've never asked for anything that's ever been knocked back and that funds things like cybersecurity, um, cloud infrastructure services, general improvement service management side of things. Uh, and then the delta is this funding bucket which is variable each year called enterprise, that's the term we use for it. And traditionally enterprise would be either IT going to an area within our business, spruiking some smart idea based on innovation or what a competitor might be doing or trying to lead the curve. And the business would say, hey, that sounds cool. Can you go and seek the funding for us and we're there for you? Mm. And when we flipped it to, well, if you feel like it's a good idea, whether they've come to us or whether we've proposed that idea, you now have to pitch it. We'll be in the room to support you and we'll do all the work in building the business case and um, you know, extrapolating out resources required, be they financial or people, et cetera. It's, it's changed the dynamic in the funding and it's also changed the dynamic in the business realisation stage throughout the project and post-project because politely and in the safety of Chatham House rules in this room, our business is on the hook as much as the technology team in, so you're forced into a beautiful partnership. And the prioritisation is done by this enterprise subcommittee, which is a subcommittee of Exco. Um, so the, the grown-ups in the room, if you will, that are accountable for moving our business forward have to fight amongst ourselves as to where the priority sits. So and that it's was, not rocket science, but it's Well, it's, it's a change different. of things. It, it puts the accountability on the business on a business case. IT isn't trying to justify a investment that is really being done for a business outcome that the business should be owning. That's right. Yeah, And that was something you were talking to me about as well, Claudine, this, this concept of the business outcome, of the focus for where people uh, need, need to get engaged. And I think your, uh, ter your term to me... Um, is it requires strong leadership from the uh, from the CIO to make sure that the business outcome is not uh, not just in IT's court; it's owned by the rest of the, the by the people in the business who who want the proposition. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I think we're, there's a recurring theme um, of, um, of fragmentation across many businesses that um, you know or, or silos that that have historically been there that that need to be overcome and. Uh, and I think, I mean, strong leadership is absolutely pivotal to be able to overcome that, to put those types of structures in place um, to bring people together. Um, and I think, yeah, often the CIO is at the, the heart of that and it's really important um, that they step up. I, I think the, the role of the CIO is, um, as I was saying earlier, it's not functional anymore. You're, you're actually leading the business in the change that needs to happen. Absolutely. And am I hearing from the four of you then really... If we're talking exponential value, it's getting the foundations in place and then IT has the stake at the table to be able to sort of be the proponent of the new ideas. You're taking away the noise or the distraction, so you, you're focusing on, on, on outcomes. So you're more strategic rather than operational. Is that your thing in there, Jacob? Yeah? 
Yeah, but it's aligned. So it's the you know the joint goals. Yeah. They could be technology goals or they could be business goals, and um, but they come together. But that sort of cohesion is, is that your experience as well, David? Yeah, probably um, collaborators probably more a better thing. That I think connecting different people in the business to um, because I guess you, in IT or tech you, you're very privileged to see across. And so, and in our team, we're privileged to have a number of our leaders on executive leadership teams. So, bringing the right people together um, is part of the job as well. And Chris, we spoke about trust, and you said the one thing your business can't leaders can't accept is misinformation or something mm -hmm. like that. We're, mm -hmm. we're talking about AI and the role of it, and people's misconceptions and all of that sort of stuff. Can you tell me what what that translates to in practice for you? We use the phrase test and learn in Charter Hall all the time. But there are tolerances with that phrase. So um, I say cautiously, some of the early implementations of generative AI from very large, let's just say US-based software manufacturers are delivering usefully wrong information is the phrase that their marketing team are using at the moment. And it's a clever phrase. It's effectively saying, well, we're going to get you further down the path through efficiency gain and automation, but we acknowledge that through hallucination, the answer isn't quite right yet. And Charter Hall's not a business that can deal with usefully wrong at this point in time. You know, we're making decisions on behalf of investors. We're trying to determine, do we buy that $3 billion building or do we divest that one? Um, I don't think our business in the test and learn um, construct is interested in necessarily experimenting when it comes to the accuracy of information is what I meant when we had that chat. Okay. okay. Uh, and the other thing I would say with regards to this, um, this, this discussion of, of sitting around a table, IT being at a table, um, again, it's an over, overused adage, but if you haven't got your basics right, then the trust in your ability to think at a higher level is questionable in my mind. You know, that I, I challenge each of us in the room to, um, to have a look at the, almost that general brand for technology within your organization. Because if you've got any challenges and issues there, it will always hinder you from actually operating at the level. You know, I loved um, session one this morning as we talk through the um, exponential value roadmap. You know, we are clearly um, well aware that we're sitting in the connected business space in the middle at the moment. And we understand where we've come from modernized IT, but we know we're not there. And I think, um, you know, to be able to offer a reliable service, a well-regarded service, just opens so many more doors. Yeah. And I know that can sound a bit uninspiring no. and boring, but if you haven't got the basics right, no, you're just not, it, not it, in the game. It, it's, it's getting the basics right. You, you know, don't run for and walk. That's the right saying I'm looking for. It's that sort of thing. And sometimes we can be ambitious on new technology, but we need to actually be pragmatic about where we're taking the business and we need to be f focused on the business outcomes to do that That's and making sure we're not isolated, we're in collaboration with people.